Today we're honoured to interview the Director of the University of Dundee's Leverhulme Research Centre for Forensic Scientists, Professor Neve Nickdade. Professor Nick Dade talks about what it takes to be a forensic scientist, how she copes with being an eminent researcher in her field, and what she thinks of crime TV shows. Enjoy listening! You're listening to Insight, the University of St Andrews Student Physics Society's podcast. I'm your host, Samuel Lavery. Join us as we journey into the lives of St Andrews academics, discovering their passions, inspirations and motivations. So today on Insight, we're incredibly honoured to have the very prolific Neve McDade, the director of the Leverhulme Research Centre for Forensic Scientists. Thank you for joining us. You're very welcome. Thank you for the invitation. So could you tell us a bit about your positions here at the University of Dundee? Sure. Um, so I hold a number of different posts here at the university. Um, I'm a professor of forensic science. Um, and I'm also, as you said, the director of the New Human Research Centre for Forensic Science. And I also uh, work in the Centre for Anatomy and Human Identification. Um, and in that role, I am the director of the Forensic Science Research Group with one of my colleagues. So fingers in a lot of different pies. Fingers in a lot of different pies. The one in Cahead is focused primarily on drug research. So we do a lot of research around new psychoactive substances in particular. Very interesting stuff. And what path led you to your position here then? Well, that's, that's a really good question. Um, it's quite sort of checkered. So uh, both of my parents are scientists. My mother was a botanist, um, is a botanist. Uh, my father was a chemist. Uh, he was an organic chemist and actually started his uh, academic career here at the University of Dundee back in the 1960s. Um, so we were always, as uh, youngsters, uh, um, encouraged to view the world in uh, an inquisitorial way. So we were, we were always questioning about how things happened, as most kids do. Um, so I was encouraged a lot to go into university, and I studied uh, chemistry and mathematics in university, and then went on to do a PhD in, in bioinorganic chemistry. And from there, um, ended up working at the University of Strathclyde in forensic science. And the reason forensic science was a draw was because both of my parents had begun uh, in the late 70s, um, early 80s, to do work as fire scene investigators over in the Republic of Ireland, where I'm from. Um, and they were the first um, fire investigators, independent fire, fire investigators in the state. So it was always there, this this idea of using science in a way that would help resolve problems that had a, either a criminal or a civil uh, legal dispute attached to them was always in my background. So you've drawn a lot of inspiration from your parents and it's come full circle with Absolutely. you coming back to Dundee. Could you tell us in a very general sense what forensics is all about then? Well, forensic science, one way of looking at it is a... Um, Discipline of disciplines, really. So we use different types of scientific and not just scientific, but social science uh, disciplines as well in the service of questions that relate to legal dispute. So in one definition of forensic science is science in the service of the law. Um, and as a consequence of that, the rigor that we place in the science that we do must also reach um, uh, levels that are required for legal admissibility into the courtrooms, whether they're civil or whether they're criminal. So it's it's very much using scientific tools in the service of answering a medical legal dispute. Okay, very concise. I like that. Um, could you tell us a bit about your research and what areas that you look at specifically? Gosh, it's, it's being the director of a research centre means that I have the great joy and privilege of working with some very clever, smart um, academic researchers at various stages in their career, uh, from PhD students up to postdocs up to principal investigators. And we've set a very broad agenda in our research centre. So we are funded for 10 years to undertake um, research that is going to fundamentally address and change the status quo of forensic science in this country. Um, our, we're, we're funded by the Levy Hume Trust and they've funded us to the tune of £10 million. Pounds. It's the biggest research grant in forensic science in the history of the UK. And as a consequence of that, the diversity of our research is quite fundamental. So at the moment, the team is looking at new avenues for DNA technology. We're looking at a lot of work around transfer and persistence of materials. So when you uh, two materials come into contact with each other, how do bits of each transfer one to the other? 
And if they transfer, how long do they stay there for? So we, as forensic scientists, these are fundamental questions to understanding the relevance of a piece of evidence in a particular set of circumstances relating to a case. But we, we know very little about it, uh, whether it's DNA or fingerprints or fibres or hair or glass or whatever it might be. So we're doing a, a big root and branches bit around that, which brings in a lot of material science work. And um, we're also looking at background abundance of stuff, uh, as I like to put it. So how much glass would you find in an ordinary person's ordinary shoes? Um, because if they're then subsequently arrested and accused of burglary and that the, that piece of glass is found in their shoe, then is it relevant to the case or is it irrelevant because it was there anyway? So answering those kind of fundamental questions requires us to engage in a lot of citizen science work where we, we create project work that then is accessible to the citizens of the country either by working with science centres or, or, or um, schools or whatever it might be. So there's a bit around material science. Um, I'm fundamentally a chemist. So our work on new psychoactive substances involves synthetic chemistry. It involves primarily analytical chemistry, which is my area. Um, and it also involves then the interpretation of that data. So we do some something called chemometrics, which is, which is looking at statistical inferences of data that's generated from chemical analysis. So we do that area. But I also have a background in psychology because I have a degree in psychology as well, which I picked up along the way because it was, it was of interest. And so I look at uh, things like bias around how evidence is appreciated by the public, around science communication, about what influences juries' feelings about reliability of expert witnesses. So we have a, a tranche of work that's uh, following that that um, that particular area. And we also within our team have got um, a fantastic legal scholar who's looking at the the whole um, relationship between science and law anyway. And what do we mean by evidence and how do we report that and communicate it? And her work stems through and weaves in and out of all of the work that we do. Um, and we also have a statistician on our staff. We've got a, a fantastic nanochemist who's looking at biosensors and their relationship now with detecting drugs. So it is vast. Mm -hmm. Forensic science is such a huge conglomeration of different disciplines that you, you point the finger at any area of science or social science or indeed humanities, and we can give you a forensic science application to it. So you've so, got this really broad yeah, remit. Ab absolutely. And it's, it's, I think when you look at some of the great scientists like Michael Faraday, who's one of my particular heroes, or um, uh, scientists right the way across the spectrum, those that have um, a, 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 an approach that's um, a, a, approach of a polymath, somebody who looks at things from different perspectives, then that's where you see great changes happening. And Part of what we do within the Leverhulme Research Centre is bring that interdisciplinarity into the core of our business so that we get the perspective of economists and lawyers and material scientists and physicists and chemists and data interpretation experts and so on and science communicators all together trying to solve a problem. It's Fantastic. great. Fantastic. So all these people coming together for that common purpose. Yeah. So what are some of the most frustrating challenges then that forensic scientists typically face in their research? Um, I, think, I think the challenges are quite profound in that what we're trying to understand is not the fastest, brightest, best technologies, but it's how do the traces that we find in the analysis that we do, how can we interpret those in a meaningful way? So I was talking about transfer persistence and background abundance. Answering those questions from a fundamental level is critical to our understanding of what the finding of a particular trace in a particular case means in the context of the set of circumstances of that case. So you're taking the finding, which is the, the piece of science, if you, if you will, and trying to put it into a framework of a problem, essentially. Could this piece of evidence have transferred given the allegation that's been made or could it have transferred uh, because of something else happening or was it there already? So there's, there's that. The other area that there is an enormous amount of work, I think, to be done is in looking at what's called the comparative problem in forensic science, and that's looking at uh, patterns like linking um, fingerprints to individuals. So you're looking at the pattern that's there within that print, um, or looking at things like listing, uh, linking bullets to guns. So you're looking at a pattern of damage that's presented, um, or indeed shoe prints, looking at patterns of footwear and so on and so forth. So all of that pattern recognition, there is no fundamental scientific base to that pretty much at all within the forensic domain. So there's a huge amount of work that we need to do 
um, that provides an objective understanding of what those patterns mean. Now, those sets of studies are pretty basic. They're not um, uh, horizon scanning blue skies research. They're pretty basic research. Um, and they're, the funding of that sort of research is very challenging uh, within the, the way in which we deliver funding uh, to research institutions and academic institutions in the UK, which is why the Leverhulme grant that we've got and the fact that it is a 10-year project and the fact that the funding allows us to do this, a very foundational, fundamental, basic research, is the thing that will step change uh, what we're doing. And it's why our centre is a disruptive centre. Fantastic. So it's on one hand, not having the classic laboratory where mm -hmm. you can control the conditions mm -hmm. and on the other it's being able to take the data that you're having and match it to pre-existing that, That's exactly databases. right. I mean, the, using new technology is important, absolutely, mm -hmm. but we need to use it wisely. Um, and using new techniques to measure things better, faster, smarter, quicker is all very well and good. But if we don't understand what the background to that trace is and how much of it is abundant in the, in the, the normal course of our daily lives, then we're limited in how we can interpret that in terms of the context of a particular case. And one of the, the, the great strengths and, and the big paradigm shift that our centre has delivered is that we work as an interdisciplinary team. But within that team, um, we also uh, create the research questions by having what we call strategic conversations. And that's with our stakeholders. And our stakeholders and one of the core stakeholders we work with are judges. And that's um, quite groundbreaking because bringing science and law together at the fundamental level to discuss honestly between each other what our challenges are um, with our practitioners and law enforcement and scientists outside of our domain and artists and writers and school ch children and um, science centre leaders and science communicators is what creates this difference and it creates a, a, a roadmap of um, challenges that are co-owned by everybody involved in that community um, such that we can then take those challenges on and do the research to underpin them properly. So it's fantastic you can do that here. In what sorts of situations would a forensic scientist be called in to give an analysis or an opinion? Um, so forensic science gets involved from crime scene to court. So that there's a continuum of work that needs to be done. So if a crime is thought to have been committed, that first decision um, sometimes can involve a forensic scientist being there to uh, look at the early circumstances of a particular case. Um, in Scotland, we uh, um, the the... I suppose the investigative control really is given to the procurator fiscal, which is a, a legal person. Um, and they work with the Crown Office, which are the people that will bring the case um, if, if there is indeed a criminal offence has been committed. So the first thing you have to establish is has, has there been a crime? Um, once that has been established, then forensic scientists in Scotland are called often to the crime scene to work with the crime scene investigators um, so that they advise or sometimes actively help in the recovery of um, different items that might have an evidential value. Those are then taken back to a forensic science laboratory and the scientific examination of those particular things recovered at the scene or things brought in later by police um, as part of their inquiries uh, are examined using different scientific tools in most cases. But in some cases, we are in this um, uh, area where the um, examination is much more subjective, like fingerprints or ballistics. After that, the scientist needs to write up their results, needs to present a report for court, and then that report is presented in either written or oral evidence in court. So your forensic scientist now is a science communicator, and their job is to stand up in the court of law and communicate their evidence in a way that's impartial, because we're servants of the court, not of who pays the bills. Um, so in an impartial way, in front of a jury most often. So you have to be able to communicate sometimes quite complex um, scientific evidence to uh, uh, members of the public such that they can make the ultimate decision as to guilt or innocence. So you're looking at somebody who can do work in the field, work um, in the laboratory, write reports in a cohesive and um, uh, easy, understandable way, and then do science communication at the other end of it. That's what a forensic scientist needs to be able to do. So very much as far away from a desk job as you can get. Most, yeah, it, and it depends on the different disciplines. So my area of expertise within um, forensic science as a practitioner is I do uh, analysis of, of drugs, but I also primarily work um, 
uh, in the fire investigation domain. So, uh, which is which is part of my upbringing. So, in in that regard, fire investigation often um, means going to uh, the scene of a fire. So you're in in an environment that's um, uncomfortable, that's not particularly nice to be in. Many occasions can be quite dangerous um, because of of, um, damage to structures and that sort of thing. And so you need to be able to cope with that. And the work is hard. It's physically hard. um, uh, But also carry that all the way through possibly to chemical analysis of some of the things recovered um, and then to be able to present that, as I said, and communicate it in the courts. Wow, there's a lot to be done. So how accurately do you think that pop culture media kind of represents forensic <laughs> scientists? Or are there any particularly good representations that spring My to answer mind? to that would have to be no. <laughs> <laughs> the um, I think the way... So what you're trying to do in a programme like CSI, for example, or, or some of the other um, uh, TV shows, is take and it, the entirety of the process I've just described, sometimes which takes weeks, sometimes longer, sometimes days, and squash it into 30 minutes or 40 minutes and make it full of entertainment and drama. Life isn't like that. So forensic scientists are much more meticulous about how they do their business. We take long amounts of time keeping our notes and making sure that our contemporaneous notes are accurate and correct. So that means that everything is done uh, very carefully. It's done in a very moderated and and careful pace so that we have great uh, reassurance that the evidence that we're ultimately presenting is scientifically valid, um, if indeed the science is there to underpin it. Um, It isn't glamorous. I can tell you that for sure. Uh, It certainly isn't glamorous. Um, And the, you know, so so the portrayal, you can see why the portrayal in fictional programs is as it is. Mm -hmm. Um, They want to engage an audience. But it's, uh, I'm not a great fan of of, um, uh, programs like CSI, and I'm not allowed to watch them at home because I shout at the television. (laughs) So it's obviously great when scientists work together for a common purpose, but you've previously been quite candid about how competitive academia Mm. can be. So is there anything that you do, any steps that you take to personally ignore or rise above others (laughs) who might like wish you ill such that they could succeed in your place? I would never suggest that my colleagues would wish me ill. Um, I think that... The working in academia has been viewed by many, I think, over the years who are not working in academia as a bit of a cushy number um, because we the perception out there is that we go and we teach our students and we, we, we get buckets of money to do research and we have, you know, a fairly um, relaxed lifestyle because we don't our, our hours aren't quite so tied down and we get those wonderful summer holidays, don't we? Um, and the answer to all of those is no, we don't. So academic life has moved, I think, in the 24 years that I've been involved in it, um, has moved from something that was that had manageable workloads um, to a, a actually quite a high stress job. Um, where there are constant demands and pulls on uh, particularly our our young academics. Um, When you get up into the heady heights of professordom, uh, as I managed to do, um, it it changes your responsibility a little bit, uh, in my view, because you're now a a senior academic. um, And as a consequence of that, our, at least the way I feel about it, is that my, my duty or that I have a duty to my younger staff in order to help them to be the best that they can be in terms of of their uh, fulfilling their desires and wishes to contribute to society, which lots of academics have a real um, drive to do. In my area of business, we're very applied in what we do. Um, Getting uh, grant funding is challenging. Um, It's not impossible, obviously, um, but it is very challenging. And you need to be open to the constructive criticism of your colleagues in order to try to 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 hit that funding uh, and and um, bring in the, the the resources that you need in order to get your research up and running and that's challenging it can re- be really challenging particularly in, a, in an applied domain such as mine I think things are changing because I think there's a big push now for interdisciplinary science um, and forensic science sits very neatly uh, as a great application for interdisciplinarity um, in terms of people trying to prevent success. I think you get that everywhere. Um, I think in academia, it's probably no worse than anywhere else, but it might be in slightly sharper focus. Um, and by that, I mean, if if you rely on senior colleagues to help you, 
um, and to to act as mentors, then you need to be very careful as to which mentors you, you choose such that they can help and unlock doors for you. And I've been very fortunate in that regard. But it, academia now means and has always meant, as far as my career has been, that you need to set goals for yourself and you need to not be afraid to set really ambitious goals. You need to work hard. Um, and, and by that, and that's a choice. But by that, I mean, you need to work hard um, and not be afraid of hard work and not be afraid of knuckling down and getting on with the job. And sometimes you need to just take some chances. You need to um, make some choices, make some brave decisions and apologize for being successful afterwards. So are there any historical figures that you think deserve more recognition for their impact on forensic science? There's one uh, in particular, and that's, as I said, one of one of the, the people that I greatly admire, um, and that's Michael Faraday, who was um, uh, credited with the um, discovery, amongst others, of uh, electricity and bringing electricity into the world. But Michael Faraday was also, I think, one of the first forensic scientists because he was very interested in fire which is an interest of mine, of course. Um, and he um, instigated this, the Christmas lectures for the Royal Institution by giving his first set of Christmas lectures on the chemical history of a candle. And they are, you can still download these lectures. You can still get a book uh, that he produced subsequently, of which I have a second edition because somebody gave me that as a present. And it's just a, a wonderful treasure of mine. And it's a set of six lectures that explains how a candle burns. Um, and it is... Um, an explanation that holds true today. And it, if you read through that set of lectures, and they were, they were, they were Christmas lectures, so they were for the public, beautifully illustrated. If you read through those, you can understand how fire works. And it's, it's just very, very well put together. But he was also involved in, in, in the investigation of explosions, particularly um, explosions in cold slack heaps. Um, and he gave evidence in court. So he was actually a forensic scientist. So and he's never really been fully credited, I, I feel, with that. So uh, so I think he um, made a, a big difference to our understanding of fires, combustion, explosions, and also to changing legislation and making improvements around fire safety. On an all around fantastic guy. And he was. He's, <laughs> we, we all love him over in <laughs> physics as well. Um, could you tell us a bit more about the work that you've been involved in on advising the government and in the legal system then? Um, that's a that's a, an interesting question. So uh, one of the things that I had the great privilege of doing was leading um, a group, again, of, of people drawn from across the um, fire investigation world in producing a code of practice for um, the investigation of fires in the criminal justice system in the UK. Um, and that took us, uh, I think, three years to write, three or four years to put together. Um, and it was wild, widely consulted across the fire investigation community, across the British Isles, um, and lots of modifications made to it so that as a community we could buy into it. And it produces a, a not quite step-by-step -step guide, but a, but a very um, significant, I think, step forward in the guidance of how fire scene investigation should be um, undertaken as, as a... a uh, best practice almost, although the best practice is not the greatest words to use. Um, and it was brought into um, being and endorsed by all of the professional bodies in April 2017. So that was, that I feel, was a, was a strong contribution that took a lot of people a lot of time to put together. But I was very privileged to, to be at the helm of that. And I've made similar um, uh, uh, best practice guides uh, to colleagues in Europe um, and I've also had the privilege of working um, with the United Nations to write guidance documents for the examination of um, new psychoactive substances and things like that. So I've been really fortunate uh, in that regard, um, but always helped by others and always been um, able to, to bring whatever skills I could bring to bear to help teams figure out a way of productively working together. And for me, that's the greatest gain that I, that I got from it. And it's fantastic that you're able to share all this knowledge. So we're kind of in a an increasingly anti-expert mm -hmm. global kind of environment. But you've previously stated that in court, a jury will still recognize a forensic scientist as an expert. And like, why do you think that is? Is that something that's also changing with time, do you think? Well, I think it's it's a very good question. It's, it's one of the things that our courts in this country 
um, decide is whether or not an expert is an expert. So it's not a decision I can make because I've got degrees and qualifications or because I've got experience. It's a decision that has to be made and is made by the courts. So for you to be or for someone to be an expert witness, that um, acceptance of you being given that privilege um, needs to be agreed at the court level and objections can be made uh, in the court as your as your name is, is being put forward. Um, and those objections need to be substantiated by either side, whether prosecution or defence, but ultimately it's a decision for the court to make. Um, when you're appearing as an expert witness, you're given a great um, privilege by the courts, but also a great responsibility. And that privilege is that you can provide evidence based on fact, which many witnesses are asked to do, but you can also provide evidence based on your opinion. And that opinion is based upon experience, knowledge, skill. So things that are outside of simply the thing that you measured and what that measurement meant. Um, being able to give opinion evidence is a great privilege because that is allowing you to draw upon the, as I said, the knowledge, the skill, the expertise that makes you um, call yourself an expert or be considered as an expert. But it also um, gives you great responsibility in terms of how you present that opinion to the jury um, because they will they will be listening to that opinion and will put some credibility into it or not, depending on your performance, of course. Um, so being an expert is something that isn't doesn't occur by right. It's something that occurs as, as part of the legal process. That said, experts within our courts um, are... Many of them are uh, required to reach particular professional competencies. So, for example, here uh, within the university, we have a number of forensic anthropologists and our forensic anthropologists are certified by their professional body, which is the Royal Anthropological Society of um, the UK and Ireland, uh, Royal Anthropological Institute, I beg your pardon, of the UK and Ireland. Um, and they go through a rigorous testing process to be certified. Um, uh, there are there are other means of certification for other types of disciplines as well. So so it's about having professional certification if it exists, but also having experience, knowledge, skill, and being able to display that in a way that the courts accept as uh, providing you with that with that um, uh, label, if you like, of being an expert. So there's very much a lot that goes into it. Yeah. Um. And as someone who presents. Um, evidence in court, you've mentioned that you need to try and remain impartial. Are there any mm -hmm. steps that you take to do that personally? Um, for, I think every expert is, is different. Um, the I wouldn't be doing my job as an expert witness to the court if I became um, emotionally involved in a case. So for me, um, the you have to keep the emotion. So for example, if you're dealing with fire fatalities, um, you have to keep the emotion out of the particular case or if you're dealing with a case that involves a homicide or an assault, um, you're there to deliver factual evidence based on your skills, based on your um, analytical measurements if they become relevant uh, and based on your interpretation of the evidence that you've viewed. Um, so for me, it, it's not, it's not, I've never found it a particularly difficult thing to do, to, to have that impartiality. Um, I think you have to have the ability to, as I said, to keep the emotion to one side. Um, I've never not been able to do that. Um, so it, it, for me, it's not it's not difficult to compartmentalise um, the different uh, aspects of the case that would that, that have bear no relevance to the piece of work that I've been asked to do. It's just looking at things with a very objective eye. Absolutely. So yeah. you've been internationally recognised for your contributions to forensic science and you're the, the director of the Leverhulme Research Centre and you advise the government. Is there anything else that you want to personally achieve within your career? Um, that's a really interesting question. I've never really planned my career. It's just mm. kind of, you know, the next thing that looks interesting has kind of bounced into into my inbox, as it were. Um, so, gosh, is there anything I want to achieve? Um, I think the, the, the success of the Leverhulme Research Centre for Forensic Science is going to be that we create or we break the status quo that forensic science is currently in, not just here in the UK, but um, elsewhere around the world. And that's a big ambition, but it's also a big achievement if we can get there. And I think we are getting there um, now quite steadily. Bringing together science and law has been the, the paradigm shift, the step change. And having now the great privilege of working with some of the very senior judges in this country um, and discussing very openly and honestly with them the challenges that we all face as a community that are working 
for um, the pursuit of justice is a huge privilege. Um, I also now get to work with the National Academy, so with the Royal Society and the Royal Society of Edinburgh. I get to work with colleagues in the National Academy of Science in the United States. Um, and also some fantastic colleagues involved in science communication. That's a real privilege. Um, one of the, the teams that we work with is the Alan Alda Center for Science Communication in New York in Stony Brook University. And their um, uh, lead figure is Alan Alda, the actor from MASH that we will all know and love. Um, and having met Alan a couple of times and spoken to him about communicating science within our domain and the importance, the absolute critical importance in the world we currently live in of having an evidence base and not just dismissing expertise um, is, is so critical as we face the challenges going into the future. And in criminal justice, it's no different from that. So there's, um, there's really a, a lot of places to go when oh, you for very sure. much watch this space. For sure. And it's, it's a real joy to, to bring together these, these different communities um, working together to, to support the work that we're trying to do within justice. And it's obviously very cool to meet Alan Oliver. Um, <laughs> He's a real gentleman. He really is. So what subject did you hate the most throughout your education? Or which topic in your That's various a, degrees? I saw. I knew you were going to ask me that question. And I was thinking, God, I don't really know if I hated anything, actually. Um, myself and French had a very interesting relationship. Um, and and I, I speak French okay-ish in that I can order coffee, actually, and do slightly more than order coffee. And I started learning French from um, my first year in secondary school. And I continued it. My university degree was a really interesting degree because I did physics, I did chemistry, I did mathematics, dropped physics, sorry, folks. Um, <laughs> and I did um, French and I did management studies, so e economics, essentially, but also mm -hmm. bookkeeping and that sort of thing. And I did that for three years and then specialised in chemistry and mathematics for my fourth year. So I had French follows me all the way around. And then when I was doing my PhD, I did French as a um, night classes because I wanted to keep the language there. But I'm just not very good at it. I try really <laughs> hard to be good at it. And I love the language and I, I, I can communicate reasonably well in it. So it's this kind of love-hate relationship I have with it. I think I should now be able to speak French, but I don't, can't really speak oh, it very well at ho all. Hopefully something clicks. <laughs> so I'm not very good at languages. Maybe that's what's coming out of it. Are there any skills or personality traits in particular that you're proud of developing since you were a student? Um, I think I have become an awful lot more tolerant than when I was as a student. I, I've learned the skills of actually stopping and listening to people and letting them, letting them uh, tell me what it is that they're trying to communicate to me and actually responding to it, I hope, in a positive way. <laughs> so we're going to move on to the quick fire round and we're going to really rattle through these. Okay. So what's your favourite music genre and favourite song? I like jazz, and I don't really have a favourite Is there anything that stands out? Um, or any bands? I like Nina know? Simone a lot. listen to her music a lot. Okay, and um, what's your favourite book? At the moment, I'm reading a book called The Art of Fire, which is by uh, an, an author called Daniel Hume, and it's about, it's got nothing to do with fire investigation, it's just about fire. Well, that sounds pretty good. Who really doesn't like fire? There you go. What's your favourite museum for art or science? We're obviously in Dundee with the new V&A. I haven't actually been into the new V&A yet. I'm going in in a couple of weeks' time. Um, I like GOMA, which is the Gallery of Modern Art in um, in Edinburgh. Not sorry, in Glasgow. Um, and I like the National Portrait Gallery in London because I can go in and see pictures of Queen Elizabeth, the first, well, and the second, but the first particularly. And I was going to ask, do you have a favourite crime TV show? But maybe it's, no. it's none. <laughs> um, do you prefer to holiday in the hot or the cold? Oh, the cold. What's your favourite colour? Green. Green. I'm Irish. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it's a good choice. How are you with the sight of blood? Oh, I'm fine. Bring it on. No problems Couldn't at care all. Couldn't care less. No problem. Do you have any odd or eccentric habits? I once tried to learn to play the saxophone because I thought I needed to diversify and have a hobby. And I like music very much. I like jazz, but I also like classical music and other types of music. Um, and so I bought a saxophone uh, very bravely and I took saxophone lessons. And I came home one evening very proud of myself because I had learned to play, I thought, the um, saxophone riff out of, um, oh gosh, what's the one that, um, oh, I've forgotten it now, but it's a very uh, well-known piece the of Eurovision music. Eurovision piece? Wasn't that? No, no, no. It's a very oh, well, a it's a very <laughs> well-known piece of music. And so I played it. It'll come back to me now in a minute what it is. So I played it and my wonderful other half sat, looked at me and said, is it happy birthday? 
And I said, <laughs> no. So that was the end of my oh, saxophone playing. That's very sad. Hey ho. <laughs> What's a snack food that you couldn't live without? Oh gosh, I don't really have snacks. I think I like eating um, uh, nuts, you know, Brazil nuts and mixed nuts and things like that. And I kind of munch my way through those. Uh, how good are you at trivia and pop quizzes? Reasonably good, actually, which is reasonably are you a sad. Good, good person to have on yeah, the team. Yeah, I, I have a broad, eclectic knowledge base, which actually worries me intensely. So, finishing question. So, you can take some more time to answer this. And as a prominent figure within your field and someone who does have this influence outside it, what advice would you give to students and researchers who are really seeking to rise to prominence within their own field? I think you need to. Um, I'm going to going to say work hard because that's um, I think it's something that held me in very good stead. I think you need to fix your mind on a goal, um, but not not have that goal so rigid that that you're inflexible about it. Um, if you want to go into forensic science, you need to get a good solid science degree. Uh, is is my uh, view and my experience. I think you need to um, not be afraid to challenge people who tell you that you're not very good at things. You might not be very good at things, but I think you need to to see that for yourself. But I think you need to people need to be not be afraid to actually not agree with people who tell them that what they're doing isn't good enough. Um, we, we all get told that, and and if a hundred people tell us that we look good in something, and one pe- person tells us we look ugly, the person we remember is the one that tells us we look ugly. And you know sometimes they're wrong. And so I think that what young people should be looking at is is setting goals, um, fixing on those goals, working hard to get them, because nothing in life comes without hard work, in my view. Um, and if you work hard for something, it really means something to you. So not to be dissuaded, not to be afraid of failing, because everybody fails. And as long as you learn from it, then you're going to progress. I think that's a fantastic place to finish. Thank you very much, Professor Neve Nick Dade. It has been my pleasure. You've been listening to Insight, the University of St. Andrews Student Physics Society's podcast. I was your host, Samuel Avery. Thanks to all the wonderful academics of St. Andrews. Join us in the future as we learn more of the people making our education. This podcast was produced by myself and our publicity officer, Connor McBride. To find out more about the Physics Society and what we do, please find us on Facebook or Google St. Andrew's Physics Society for our website. Goodbye.